we now call APRS. APRS versus packet radio. The big question people will I hear all the time will ask me, well, packet radio, isn't that the same as APRS? While APRS is built on the packet radio subsystem, they really do have two different logics going on. Nor normal packet radio has tended to be to only show usefulness in passing bulk methods traffic like email from point to point, i.e., I connect to a TNC, I pass some traffic, I disconnect from the TNC. I connect to another TNC, I pass some traffic, I disconnect from the TNC. Sometimes I'll go through a network of TNCs to get to the final mailbox, but ultimately it ends up being a point-to-point -point communication. There really isn't a well-defined process to saying, I transmit and a whole bunch of people here at the same time. Uh, it has been difficult to apply conversational packet systems to real-time events where information has a very short life cycle and needs to get to everyone fast, like the Twin City Marathon. <laughs> Somebody's down. You don't want to like figure out what packet you know to connect to. I'm going to that one. And the guy's over there. Why are you coming to me? I'm on Chicago and Fourth. The guy's down on you know the Franklin and Avenue Bridge. They're going to help me. Okay. APRS, on the other hand, turns packet radio into a near, near real-time tactical communications and display system. That is one of the greatest needs in emergency and public service applications. Here are the key differences in APRS from regular packet. One, integration of maps and other displays to organize the data display data. You don't go out to your TNC, connect to it, and get a whole bunch of neat little maps popping up. I haven't seen it at least. That's one of the big things in APRS delivers you. A screen that shows you at a glance a lot of useful information. Hey, look, there's a tornado going through here. A lot of people don't realize the uh, National Weather Service is now broadcasting alerts on APRS. If you have your APRS screen and you're in a truck or a car, they will pop up a little message on your screen. You click on it, you read the message, and it says tornado here, strong winds here, uh, um, the National Weather Service has uh, issued a tornado watch in this zone, and they pop up more or less as soon as they put them out on the air. Okay? uses a one-to-many protocol to update everyone near real time. This is a big difference. That's what the National Weather Service does. They transmit a signal, they say it's a broadcast, everybody in hearing range and everybody down the digipeters get that message on the screen. If you did that with a traditional packet, you'd end up connecting to one, and it's connecting, connect to the next guy, and it's connect, connect, take a lot of time. So this is that like a big voice. Uses generic digipeating so that prior knowledge of the network is not required. I.e., you can be dumb as a rock and just use it. <laughs> so, which way do we go, George? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Since 1997, <coughs> worldwide <coughs> parent internet backbone linking everyone worldwide. Well, I, I, I did take that off the website and I decided to leave it the way it was. They're close, but not quite there. I want to outline this large digital voice thing again, because this is something that we haven't been taking a lot of advantage of. We've been just focusing on maps, but this is very important to emergency communication. APRs provide universal connectivity to all stations by avoiding the complexity of and limitations of connecting networks. <coughs> okay, lots of mumbo jumbo basically means if you're on and you broadcast everybody, everybody hears it. You can also broadcast to a specific subgroup or to a specific individual point to point. It's not required to do a broadcast all the time. And when you see the APRS software, you actually see that there are different buckets in there. It permits any number of stations to exchange data just like voice users would on a voice net. Any station that has information to contribute simply sends it, and all the stations receive it and log it. Okay, I've wrapped that point home. So now you can use APRS to do a global broadcast. We now all know that. We didn't know that when we came in, right? Go ahead. Oh, this is way ahead of me. So where can you find uh, APRS? Well, most North American APRS radio traffic is found on the two meter band at 144.390. Setting up the... Dave's pushing me here. There's only 10 flags, Dave. We've got to go a little slower. Now they use it for Setting up... <laughs> 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 
setting up the equipment. Okay, now we get into the technical good, good stuff. Okay, we now know that the APRS is a system for providing information in a useful way to the user. We know that it uses traditional digital networks, and we've rammed home the point that it's a digital voice. You can actually cover a large area with messages or a small area with messages. Okay, <coughs> this is the 10,000 foot or above approach to setting up. Um, APRS. When you're done reading this, you will not go home and set up APRS and everything will be wonderful. There is a little bit more we're going to go through, but this will give you sort of the, the generic, very crude view how you do it. Setting up the equipment. Well, you will need a terminal node controller or TNC and an interface cable for the computer. Duh. <laughs> you can also buy um, a sound card and buy a packet software that goes on the sound card and use it as your TNC. I think Al has done that already. Yeah, to uh, use your sound card as a TNC and basically you hook a radio receive, maybe you need a capacitor uh, to couple of audio signal. It's even got a bit of a software to, to show you what the amplitude is so you can tune, change your volume so it doesn't start clipping. Mm -hmm. But uh, you're, you're receiving APRS Easy. Now, although I did not pick either of the two choices that are on the screen, the Cantronics or the uh, PACCOM, I'm using the time wave myself, um, these are the two most predominant TNCs you find in this field. Well, that's because time wave now owns PACCOM. The old PAC rat. Mm -hmm. Whatever. They own, they're all owning everybody else, so it's kind of hard to tell who owns who these days. Um, the Cantronics is probably one of the best products still available. You can get it at most. Most of the stores near you, so we got one of them. That should be easy to figure out that is. The PACCOM Handy Pack and the uh, Pico Pack, Pico, Pico, Pico Pack, are nice because they're small. They're full TNCs, unlike the Tiny Track that we should talk about, which is just an encoder transmit. It's a full TNC, transmit and receive. So if you wanted to use that palm by the track people, you would use something like that. But the Tiny Track is only $40 plus uh, you buy the normal Tiny Track. Block. And the uh, can track is about $180, and the handy pack is about $300 if you get all the toys, or about $200 if you buy the basic unit. So there's a wild bit of difference between the full TNC and the tiny track. You will need a transceiver set up on the APRS frequency for 144.39. It does not require you to use a uh, unit with a VFO in it or uh, digital. Uh, it could be a crystal. Locked in. It's a simplex. It doesn't transmit on one and receive another, so it's basically transmitting and receiving on 14439. Um, a national brand mobile rig such as Icon, Kenwood, Yahoo, Yesu, I got some Yahoo, so I can call them Yahoo. Yahoo or Alingo. And a power supply will deliver 50 watt output typically and will come in handy if you live in the Thule's. 